This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. It sounds unbelievable, but many people say that this man has uncanny psychic abilities which enable him to communicate with those who have passed away and comfort those who mourn them. His name is George Anderson, and tonight we will examine his claims and witness an actual psychic session which has surprising results. In September of 1988, David and Cynthia DeWallaby were shocked by the brutal murder of their seven-year-old daughter, Jacqueline. Two months later, their nightmare became a descent into hell when authorities charged them with a crime. Also tonight, a heartwarming update. Thanks to our viewers, a woman has finally found her long lost brother. Join me for their joyous reunion on another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. During the past five years, Unsolved Mysteries has broadcast several stories about people who seem to have uncanny psychic abilities. One of them was Dorothy Allison, a New Jersey housewife who had envisioned several clues which helped police locate the body of a young boy drowned when he fell into a rain-swollen creek. Later, we aired the haunting tale of Teresita Bassa, a murdered woman who purportedly spoke through a friend to name her own killer. When police arrested the man, he confessed. And finally, there was a story of Coral Poge, a British woman who draws eerie portraits. Her clients say that Coral's drawings uncannily resemble their deceased loved ones, people whom Coral could never have met. What these stories have in common is that no one, not even the most hardened skeptic, has come up with a rational explanation for what appear to be genuine psychic episodes. That is also true of the man you're about to meet, George Anderson of Long Island, New York. He seems to have an uncanny ability to communicate with the spirits of those who have passed on. At times, it does seem even for me that I am literally listening to them or listening to a conversation or feeling I'm listening. I don't want people to get the impression it's all like I'm hearing clearly as I'm hearing you right now. It's a feeling that you're seeing, a feeling that you're hearing, a sensation more. It's like getting an electrical charge all through yourself. I was hosting a popular late night radio talk show on a rock station on Long Island where I had been for Joel Martin first heard of George Anderson in 1980. Radio station and the format we uh, dealt heavily with unexplained phenomena. Just answer me with yes or no. Don't add any more information than that. Just we'll let the spirits do the work. Martin called George in for a reading. According to both men, they had never met before. And George says he knew nothing about Martin's background. When George conducts readings, he sometimes makes random marks on a pad to enhance his concentration. George himself does not appear in our recreations of his readings, which are based on eyewitness accounts and transcripts. He's saying yes, you're saying and no. he started to talk about Shirley, my late wife, who had been killed the year before. In 1979, she was hit and killed by a car crossing a street in New York. Do you take the name of Shirley? Sh Shirley, does that name mean something to you? Yes. Uh, she says you know her. Uh, she's recently passed on suddenly. Uh, yes. She points to her face and, and to her head, uh, pain. Uh, maybe something happened that uh, I'm feeling, uh, the pain is coming through me. I'm feeling pain in the head and the face. She, um, it may be a car accident. Uh, how, do, how do you know that? 
Well, she's standing right behind you. No, no, you, you can't see her. You, I, only I can see her. She's a spirit. She's, she's right there. Uh, yes, stricter. Then he did something that made me realize something legitimate was going on that could not be explained by any, any way that I could reason. She, she's pointing her finger. She's, she's waving it back and forth very quickly, very quickly like that. Stop it. Stop it. Whenever she was annoyed at me, she would say, you're like a little boy. You're just like a little... But that was only a private thing that she and I knew. Nobody would have known that. So now I'm figuring out how the heck I could not have told that to anybody. There's no way he could have known this or, or should have known it. That's a very private thing. Also, there's another male... You lose a male friend. Joel Martin persuaded George Anderson to undergo tests with the acting chief of neurology at a New York City hospital. According to Martin, George's EEG was extremely unusual. While George conducted a session with an off-screen subject, half of his brain registered sleep, while half showed normal waking patterns. The neurologist who conducted those tests, he said he had never seen anything like it before, and is it what we expect to see? No. Is it what's supposed to happen? No. Is something unusual going on? Yes. Joel Martin had always considered himself a skeptic at matters of the paranormal. After meeting George Anderson, he became a believer. Martin began to give George a significant block of time on his radio call-in show, and George Anderson became something of a celebrity in his hometown. George was born in Lindenhurst, Long Island, New York in 1952. When he was six, George was stricken with a severe case of chickenpox. He almost died, and immediately afterwards, he says he began to hear voices and see visions of people who had recently passed away. Something about water? Uh... Eventually, George's parents, strict Roman Catholics, resigned themselves to their son's apparent abilities. George began to earn his living by conducting psychic readings. To date, he has held such readings for thousands of people. There's no reason to think they won't continue that way. It's good. Barbara and John Licata contacted George Anderson in 1982, four months after the death of their 16-year-old son, David. David had gone out to a party. If I'm quiet, I can still hear his footsteps going out and the door slamming shut. He had to be in by 12.30. Um, I went to bed, but I laid there awake because I don't sleep until my kids are in. And at 1.30, I got up because it was unlike David not to call. David? Mr. Licata? Yes? This is Licata. I need to talk to you about your son. And then I knew. It was um, a night of hell. You know, if anybody wants to know what hell is like, that's what it's like. David Licata had been killed by a hit and run driver. John was troubled by Barbara's deep depression over David's death and by their oldest son's overriding bitterness toward the driver who had killed his brother. At Barbara's request, John reluctantly agreed to a session with George Anderson. George Anderson claims that with the Lakatas, as with all his clients, he had no prior information about them. He only knew that the family was in mourning. Have you recently lost a son? Yes. Um, some sort of accident passed suddenly. I'm, I'm seeing, I keep seeing a vehicle of some kind. Yes. He's saying he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He's 16? Was he about 16? Yeah, he was 16. He's telling me, he, it's very confusing because he's very restless. Was he very emotional? <laughs> yes. Very emotional. Yes. Because he's, he's talking a mile a minute. I... I can recall their son David coming through very strongly. Um, very high-spirited personality, no pun intended. And, uh, also very anxious to reach out to his parents to give them and his family the assurance that he was all right. There were a lot of things, very specific pieces of information 
that came forth in this reading that there was no way that George could have known, because he didn't even know who I was, much less link me to this information. A lot of hostility. He's saying hostility uh, about this. You, his brother, you, your yes. son. Yes. Very hostile, still holding bad feelings. Yes. He's saying, forgive. Got to forgive. Um, if, if he can forgive, everybody else should be able to forgive, because he's the one over there. I felt this enormous relief when we made contact with David through George. It was a total relief because um, I felt like you arrived, you're in the other world, you're still alive, and I will see you again. And there's a reason for all of this. I don't know what the reason is, but I will see you again. Six years almost to the day after David Lakata died, another boy, David Elliott of Rochester, New York, was killed in a snow skiing accident at the age of 17. Several weeks later, the deaths of the two boys would become oddly intertwined when John Elliott bought a book about George Anderson called We Don't Die. The book dealt with the case of David Lakata. While John Elliott was reading it, he dreamed he had a session with George Anderson. In the dream, George said he saw John's son David standing with David Lakata. You take the name David, because I'm seeing David Lakata with a soccer ball, and he's telling me that your son's name is also David. The dream seemed so real that I decided I ought to pursue a reading with George. My background is in science and engineering. Circumstantial evidence doesn't prove anything to myself. Uh, I need the hard facts. And so I wanted a number of things out of any, vision, any trip to George to convince myself that he was doing something like what's claimed in his book. A month and a half after John Elliott had his dream, he and two of his other sons, Mark and Jack, attended a reading with George Anderson. John Elliott sat at the back of the room, and his son sat at the front. John claims that George Anderson had no idea who they were or that they were related. And I decided I would sit back and be the skeptic and give him no information. You prove it to me. The man in the back, uh, you've had a son pass recently? Uh, yes. Um, he's saying... I'm sorry, I've, I've lost the signal. I so wanted to out. see that there was a signal involved. I wanted to know that he wasn't reading my mind. And he goes, I have to stop now. I lose the signal, quote, signal, uh, when lightning storms arrive. And I sat there, like, with my pen checking off number one. There's a signal involved. Uh, it, it, it's not real clear, but something about s 17? He, he, 17, does that mean anything? Yeah. His age? Yes. He was 17 when he passed? Passed suddenly? Yeah. Uh. George Anderson's attention then shifted to one of John Elliott's sons. Do you have, uh, does the, do you take the name Madel Madeline? Yes, uh-huh. A mother vibration, maybe grandmother? Uh-huh, yeah. Grandfather da Donald, married uh -huh. to Donald? Yes. They're, they're around you now. Um, <laughs> the, the, now your grandparents are moving over behind this young man here. Uh, they're saying they're protecting. Uh, are you two brothers? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Yes. They're saying yes. Sport. Very, I'm getting a lot of sports here. Do you play? Uh, uh, I'm seeing some sort of bas a hoop or uh, and a ball, maybe uh, basketball. Uh, and then Mark spoke up at soccer. I play soccer. And George says, oh, this is really strange. And I'm listening to all this and saying, now what could be strange to a psychic? And, hoop and, and, and what was really strange in my mind is if he's got this vision of a Lakata boy with a soccer ball, that would even be strange to a psychic. Oh, OK, now I understand, because I'm seeing, all of a sudden, I'm seeing David Lakata is there, uh, dressed in his soccer uniform. I'm seeing David Lakata. He's, he's wearing his soccer out. He's, the, he's here as a clue. 
the, the name the name David and and soccer. Um, do, do you take the name of David? Yes. Yes. Your your David your father of these two boys. Yes, I am. And you you've lost a, now it's now he's coming. To, okay, you've lost a son named David. You've lost a brother named David. Finally, he's coming through. I didn't boy that was freak. I didn't know why. David Licata is there. He's saying yes. Now, now your son is coming through. They're talking and almost laughing about it. He used him as a very clever but very freaky. Uh, uh, your son is coming. I'm sitting there having George relive my dream and my yeah. parents identified. And I would call myself numb. I sat there and was amazed by just about everything I'd asked for happened. Uh, and I came away without being able to doubt him. I definitely have changed my attitude towards a life after this. Over the years, I've learned to accept and believe that David, as well as all the rest of my relatives, are with us all the time. I constantly question it. I constantly say to myself, gee, if this is real, why doesn't it work like this? It should work like this. I should be able to do this. But I can't doubt it just because it doesn't work the way I feel it should work or the way you feel it should work. It's working the way it's supposed to work, and I guess it's easier just to accept it as it is. To satisfy our own curiosity about George Anderson's apparent ability to communicate with the dead, Unsolved Mysteries asked a bereaved family from Queens, the Kenneth Silbermans, to meet with George. As far as we were able to ascertain, George Anderson and the Silbermans had never met, nor did he know anything about them or their son, who had recently passed away. 33-year-old Barry Silverman died last February, the victim of a virulent form of cancer which spread to his lungs. Something is changing within your career. Barry's parents and his sister, Joy, agreed to a session with George. What you are seeing is an actual reading conducted by George Anderson, shot with multiple cameras. Well, there's definitely two male presences around you, and I'm sure there's two males close to you passed on someplace, so don't say anything, let me just go with it. Someone also claims to be your dad. Your dad passed also? Yes, because somebody's on your, behind you. Does your, your father have a good sense of humor? Because yes. he joked. He said um, he doesn't want you to feel left out. He claims your boy is with him. So you obviously must have lost a son, because he keeps saying your boy is with me, and I'm sure he passed on as a young adult, but he's still your son, he's still your boy. I hear the name Barry. Um, does the name Barry mean anything yes, to you? that's our son. Barry says the message Barry. that I just gave you, come, this is how you'll know it's for real, that it comes from Barry. Oh, yeah. Why do I feel as if I lose my air? Does that make sense? Yes. The injury I feel much. is in here. Right. And he said, you lose your, I'm losing my air. So there's like pressure in my chest as if I'm injured in the chest, but I'm obviously feeling whatever the circumstances are. Were you concerned you let him down? Yes. Because he keeps saying, you didn't let me down, you didn't let me down, you didn't let me down, but he directs it at you more specifically. Because he pointed <laughs> at you and he keeps saying, you didn't let me down. <laughs> I, I did let him down. I really said that. Very sensitive, warm guy. He sends his love to the three of you. As he says to you specifically now, when you leave, it's like he's giving orders. He says, when you leave here, you leave here with peace. He says, you didn't fail me. And he says, now you stop feeling guilty. And he says, you let that go and put your heart at rest. He says, because he's all right, he's at peace. Until we meet again, go on with your lives. Try to be as happy as you can be. Until we meet again, know that you'll be with me again. When you about him, he's honest. <laughs> you hear from him, you'll know it's for real. And with that, he withdraws with the others. Pray for us until we meet again, and there they go. Okay, you can relax the way they went. I feel a lot better, I really do. I feel that Barry's really with us and, and you know, we'll be together someday and, uh, you know, don't, that doubt is, you know, human beings are funny. I guess you never get rid of it completely, but I feel much more convinced. I am just so relieved 
to hear that he's not suffering and that he's happy. And I do believe he spoke with George Anderson and there's so many things that he has told us that were so true that I, I feel so much better. I, I feel very relieved. I'm still skeptical. I'm still have my days where I'll walk upstairs and I'll call my best friend in New York City and I'll say to him, ah, this stuff's all a bunch of bull. I don't know why I keep doing this. But then that's few and far between. Then there are the times where you know something is happening that you cannot explain. Plus when you see the effect it has on the people in a positive way where it helps them, I guess it's my job to mind my own business and stay out of it and just continue to be the instrument and let the person receive what comfort comes from it. And that's what I try to do. As much as we might want to believe in George Anderson's abilities, our rational, logical minds tend to discount them. Still, after seeing George Anderson in action, one might speculate, to paraphrase Shakespeare, that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophies. Next, the tragic story of a couple charged with the murder of their own daughter, plus an update in which our viewers help close a case. Nineteen forty seven, a small California town near the Oregon border. A woman walking home from the grocery store found an abandoned two year old girl who had been severely beaten. Amy, are you all right? Oh my God, come with me, sweetie. We'll get some help for you. Through newspaper articles, the little girl was identified as Mary Jane Medlin of Selma, Oregon. Police arrested Mary's mother and her boyfriend on charges of child abandonment and assault with attempt to commit murder. Both were sentenced to 20 years in prison. Mary, her older sister Leoma, and her baby brother Jimmy eventually became wards of the state and were placed with different families. In 1991, Mary finally found her sister Leoma. They immediately joined forces to find their younger brother, Jimmy, whom Mary had only seen once when he was just an infant. Well, I feel that the missing link is Jimmy to make our family complete. And I would like to know where he is, what happened to him, what kind of a life he has, and like him to know that we're here and, and that, that we're his sisters. The night of our broadcast, Jimmy was not watching Unsolved Mysteries, but his adopted sister was. She immediately called her mother, who then contacted Jimmy. His name is now Donald Barrow, and he was just as anxious to meet his sisters as they were to meet him. Two weeks after our broadcast, Donald and his family drove from their home in Fresno, California, to Mary's home in Placerville, Donald, Mary, and Leoma had not seen each other in 45 years. You must be Donald. I am. Uh, oh, oh, you didn't think you were going to make it. Oh, we... oh, the one God. thing that I was concerned about is was it going to be OK? God, you look so good. There, there is a resemblance. <laughs> and I knew when I met him out of the car that it is OK. And I am so happy. <laughs> we, didn't, we, just, we, we didn't think we didn't think good because we just thought of that Thank this morning you. i just think that seeing him and knowing that he's had a good life that was something that mary and i both were concerned with that we wanted to make sure that he'd had a good life and knowing that he did makes us very happy uh, I'm not very good at, at, at emotions, so I don't know how to explain all of them that were going through my mind, but there were, there were a lot of them. Oh, and uh, there still are. Now I'm going to find out what it's like to be a baby brother. <laughs> <laughs> and I still get to be the oldest sister. <laughs> and I, we all know I'm the middle child. <laughs> 
September 10, 1988, began as an ordinary Saturday morning in Midlothian, Illinois. David DeWallaby and his son Davey were up early. They were careful not to wake the rest of the family, including David's mother, who lived in a basement apartment. At around 7.15, David DeWallaby noticed that the front door was partially open. My first reaction was that my mother must have come home and left it open. I went into the kitchen, I looked in the driveway for her car, and her car wasn't there. And, you know, again, the first reaction was that she must have came home in the middle of the night, went back out, and left it open. Two hours later, David's wife, Cynthia, got up and went in to wake their seven-year-old daughter, Jacqueline. Hey, Dave, have you seen Jacqueline? Dave, have you seen Jacqueline? No, isn't she in a room? No, uh, is she with your mom? No, I don't think mom came home last night. Oh, well, we should probably find her, I'll just... David and Cynthia initially assumed that Jacqueline was out playing with friends in the neighborhood. Jacqueline was Cynthia's daughter from a previous marriage. After Cynthia and David married, he felt so close to Jacqueline that he legally adopted her. After thoroughly searching the house, David took his son with him to look around the neighborhood. Hey, Paula, you haven't seen Jacqueline around here, have you? No, not this morning, I haven't. I had checked two or three homes, and then we went out in my truck, and we drove around the neighborhood going to friends who lived a little further down and just you know, driving around the blocks and uh, getting out of the truck, looking in backyards with her swing sets. Jacqueline! 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 I started to get more nervous. Started to walk quicker and Jacqueline. call louder. When I went back into Jacqueline's room, and I noticed that her comforter was missing and that it was very unusual for her comforter to be missing because she doesn't play with it. You find her? No, we've been every house in the neighborhood. No one's seen her. I've been through the whole house. She's not there. Her, her quilt's gone. Do you know where that is? No. All right, well, I'm going to go check the Morgans. Okay, okay? I'm going to give I was cutting through my yard to look into my neighbor's backyard, and that's where I noticed the window. The window to the basement apartment had been broken into. It appeared that an intruder had used it to gain access to the house. Dave, call the police. Is this a picture of Jacqueline? Yes. I hold on to it? Within hours, the Dewallaby household was swarming with police and FBI agents who assumed that Jacqueline had been kidnapped. They set up wiretapping equipment to record any calls which might come in with ransom demands. But a kidnapper never called. Four days later, Jacqueline's body was discovered in a vacant field in the adjacent community of Blue Island, Illinois. Found at the scene were the comforter from her bed, her nightgown, and a 26-foot length of rope which had been wrapped around her throat. It is difficult to imagine a parent's agony upon losing a child. But imagine the additional horror of being accused of killing your own daughter. That is exactly what happened to David and Cynthia DeWallaby. Indeed, to this day, some investigators are still convinced that David and Cynthia murdered Jacqueline, despite their long-standing claims of innocence. Four years later, the authorities continue to ask the same question. If the DeWallabies did not kill their daughter, then who did? Did you like to sit down or something? No, it's fine. What else? What else? What time did you get up this morning? Um... From the moment they were notified, the police investigation into Jacqueline's disappearance was two-pronged. Um, he said he didn't know he hadn't seen her. While they pursued the possibility of a kidnapping, they began a detailed questioning of both Cynthia and David. At that point, your wife was still asleep. She was still sleeping. Isn't that kind of strange? I mean, I, I know in my house with my kids, one of the kids get up, it's like the whole family's up. You know? Well, no, they like to sleep, so we let them sleep, and they. Uh... It was hard answering their questions because so telling the police that you woke up around 8 isn't good enough. They wanted us to get it as close as possible. And so we were forced to try to re get really close to times when really all that was on our mind was Jacqueline. I didn't want them asking me questions, although you answer them as you're walking past them and pacing. But it was just totally chaotic. And the repeated questions of what did you do in the morning, it seemed so senseless because I said, you know, where's my daughter? Just find Jacqueline. That's all I wanted them to do. Yes. Yes, we did all this. I know they'll tell you that 
they felt as though they were being harassed and being accused. I think any reasonable individual has got to, got to understand that you're in the house, your daughter's missing, you're a suspect. Investigators naturally directed their attention to the basement window. Shards of glass on the uh, towel rack. Initially, they believed that the window had been smashed by someone on the inside to suggest that an intruder had broken it to gain entry. Do people call you David? Yes. Are you over 21 years old? Yes. On Sunday, September 11th, the day after Jacqueline disappeared, David agreed to take a polygraph test at FBI headquarters in Chicago. Did you help or plan with anyone to cause Jacqueline's disappearance? No. Please remain facing the front. Did you help or plan with anyone to cause Jacqueline's disappearance? No. Are you withholding any information? As I left, I asked the agent next to me if I passed, and he said I passed with flying colors. any of the questions? Three days went by. The police still had no leads to Jacqueline's whereabouts. They requested that David and Cynthia sit and wait. Yeah, I remember the days were very long. Uh, you know, the days seemed like weeks. And then the night, we would, we, Cindy and I would be in the room trying to imagine where she might be. Uh, you know, I just remember that's all that was on our minds, is trying to figure out where she could be. On the very day Jacqueline's body would be found, David DeWallaby was asked to take a second lie detector test. Of course, I wanted to know why and what was wrong with the first one. And their answer was something to the fact that uh, the state likes to use their own. The results from the second test were inconclusive. The report cited David as an uncooperative subject. However, he believes the results stem from a disagreement he had with a state agent administering the test. At one point, he asked me to answer yes to all of his questions. In other words, he wanted me to lie so he could see how his tests would result in me lying. And I said, OK. And, the, and like the second question he asked me was, did you kill your daughter? And he wanted me to answer yes to that. And I, I told him I can't do it. And he got into a little argument. He was turning red in the face. And, and he said, we have to do it this way. You have to you know, lie. And I don't mind telling him my name is not Dave, Dave DeWallaby. And I don't mind some things. But I told him I, I can't say yes to a question like that. And uh, he, he, it upset him. After the second test, David was interrogated for another five hours. Finally, an officer interrupted. We think we found Jacqueline. Is she OK? I'm sorry, she's dead. I was convinced that these police were lying to me about my daughter's death as a last-ditch effort to try to get me to confess to something. You liars. Because of the way the interrogation was going, they were getting frustrated. David, Jacqueline is dead. No, I didn't believe it, and I probably didn't want to believe it. When David returned home and saw his wife and mother, he knew the police had told him the truth. <laughs> Cindy was on the couch crying, and I ran up to her and I asked her if it was true, and she said, yes, you know, we lost our daughter. No. The feeling was, well, it can't be, like, it's impossible. Yeah. It's just too much of a bizarre nightmare, you know, to be real, and you feel like it must be a dream. It was hard to accept, very hard. First thing I said was, who did it? Who would do this? I can't explain how I felt, because I, I think I went into shock, because I just laid on the couch, crying. An autopsy was unable to determine when Jacqueline had been murdered. On September 17, 1988, she was laid to rest. The joint investigation now included the Illinois State Police, the Midlothian Police, and the police in Blue Island, where Jacqueline's body had been found. 
For two months, they collected evidence and built a case against the Duolabes. Finally, in November of 1988, David and Cynthia Duolabe were charged with Jacqueline's murder. Cynthia was two months pregnant. In April of 1990, David and Cynthia Duolabe went on trial for the murder of their daughter, Jacqueline. All right. The prosecution built its case largely on circumstantial evidence. Could you tell us what the car looked like, sir? It appeared to be a dark color. One prosecution witness, a transit worker named Everett Mann, picked David DeWallaby out of a photo lineup. He claimed that on the night of the murder, he saw a man with a prominent nose, like David's, in a parked car near the site where Jacqueline's body was discovered. Did you make out any features of that person? Yes, it was the nose structure. Could you tell whether it was a man or a Everett Mann's claim was that from 75 yards away, three quarters of the length of a football field, on a moonless night in a dark parking lot, he saw a profile of a nose structure that resembled David DeWallaby's nose structure. I've been there. The police have been there. Every rational person knows that that's a physical impossibility. The photo spread that Everett Mann was shown was of five photographs, all of white males, all frontal. He saw the man in the parking lot from a side view. Also, David DeWallaby's photograph was 30% larger than the other four photographs in the spread. So therefore, by definition, David DeWallaby's nose was the largest. If he saw a very large nose, he picked out David DeWallaby's photograph because that was the largest nose in the photo spread didn't mean that he saw David Dualby. You remember what time of day it was? Before the trial, two other eyewitnesses had claimed they saw Cynthia Dualby's car in the same area shortly after the murder. However, those sightings were later discredited. At the exact times the car was allegedly seen, it was actually parked in front of the Dualby's house. Another central issue in the prosecution's case was a broken window which led into the basement apartment. The entire law enforcement investigation in this case was based on a faulty assumption, namely that the basement window had been broken from inside as part of an effort by the Dualabies to cover up a crime that they had committed. Well, it turned out that they had already arrested and indicted the Dualabies before the official forensic report came back on the window, which conclusively showed that they had been wrong and that the basement window had indeed been broken from the outside. Uh, but by that point, there was no turning back. The prosecution also questioned whether it was possible for someone to enter the house without disturbing the items which were perched beneath the window. I found it very difficult to believe the theory that someone would break in a window in the middle of the night and traverse over a nightstand, a towel rack, a TV tray, makeup and, and nail polish, and not disturb anything. It's incredible to imagine someone even kicking in a window and making that kind of racket in the middle of the night, uh, knowing there's a people in the home. To prove that such an entry was possible, David DeWallaby shot this videotape of a neighbor crawling through the window. The prosecution was telling the judge and the media that if someone were to come in, they would have to step on this towel rack and bend it. So we put the towel rack under the window, and we had my neighbor crawl in while we were shooting it with a camera. And what happened is he slid in on his belly, and right before he got to the towel rack, he, he wedged his foot on the wall and held himself out, hang, hanging off the uh, window ledge. So we proved it to ourselves, and we taped, recorded it so that it was, if there was a chance, we could prove it to others. I ask that the indictments against David and Cynthia Dewallaby be set aside for a while. The Dewallabies never testified on their own behalf. Before closing arguments, the judge addressed attorneys from both sides without the jury present. Now, it's my position that there is sufficient evidence for David Dewallaby's case to go to the jury. As to Cynthia Dewallaby, and as a legal matter, I'm ruling that there is insufficient evidence for her case to go to the jury. The court was adjourned for a while, and um, we just kept telling David in the hall that he was next and he was next, that this is obviously where the jurors heading also. Have you reached a verdict in this case? Yes, Your Honor, we have.
The jury deliberated for three days on the fate of David DeWallaby. I was really up. I felt for sure we were going to get a not guilty verdict. Will the defendant please rise? You know, of course, I'm so anxious. I was trying to read into the judge's eyes, into his reaction of what it could be, but I was getting nothing. We, the jury, find the defendant, David DeWallaby, guilty of murder in the first degree. We, the jury, find the defendant, David DeWallaby, guilty of concealment of a homicidal death. I think I went into shock. I wasn't even conscious of anything around me. Uh, it was unbelievable. And, uh, it didn't matter what happened to me at that point, because I really wasn't there, even though I was. David DeWallaby was sentenced to 45 years in the Stateville Maximum Security Prison in Joliet, Illinois. But even as he began serving his sentence, a grassroots movement was being organized by Cynthia and friends of the family to reverse the decision. Their efforts caught the attention of Chicago journalist David Protes. In a series of newspaper articles, he criticized the official investigation. Well, Carol, the Duwalby trial ended in a split decision because it was a circumstantial case. There was no physical evidence. Later, television reporter Paul Hogan collaborated with protests in a series of investigative reports. It to be that way. Our expert says state police evidence technician, whose primary job was to seek out and collect all physical evidence, should have immediately collected and inventoried the glass. Instead, he waited three days and then had to retrieve it from a trash basket. He should have the news reports and shifting public sentiment brought about a stunning turn of events. Just about out? He's just about ready to come out. Oh, that's great. So, yes, we just got the phone call. In October of 1991, the Illinois Court of Appeals unanimously overturned the verdict and dismissed David DeWallaby's case. He was released from prison after serving 18 months. Today's not a day to be bitter or to look back. I'm just looking forward to seeing my family. So maybe in a few weeks or so, once it's sunk in, I might look back and uh, decide what to do next. But what are you going to say to the kids? And the appellate court, in my mind, did not find David Dwallaby innocent. They released him for lack of evidence. Someone in that home was responsible for Jacqueline's death. And I still believe that. I haven't. Um, discovered any evidence and been told any other, uh, given any other facts that would lead me to believe any differently. We're left with the mystery of what happened to Jacqueline and we wonder all the time what could have happened to her, um, who could have hurt her. You know, we just want uh, the ability to, um, to try to go on, but we want to find out what happened to Jacqueline. You know, we, we want justice. What it all boils down to is we lost a precious little girl. And nothing beyond that is as bad as losing Jacqueline. Going to prison, uh, being accused of this crime, it's all bad, but it, it doesn't compare to losing Jacqueline. So, you know, that, that was um, the hardest part of, every, of it all, and, and we keep falling back on the same uh, and Jacqueline. Update. After we aired this story, two viewers called our telecenter with crucial information which refuted the alibi of one of the original suspects in the case. As a result of the new revelations, the state attorney's office reopened the investigation of Jacqueline de Wallaby's murder. However, at this time, there are no plans to file new charges in the case. Join me next time. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery.